Johann Christoph Friedrich von Schiller was a German poet, philosopher, physician, historian, and playwright. During the last 17 years of his life, Schiller struck up a productive, if complicated, friendship with the already famous and influential Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. They frequently discussed issues concerning aesthetics, and Schiller encouraged Goethe to finish works he left as sketches. This relationship and these discussions led to a period now referred to as Weimar Classicism. They also worked together on Xenian, a collection of short satirical poems in which both Schiller and Goethe challenge opponents to their philosophical vision. Early Life and Career Friedrich Schiller was born on 10 November 1759, in Marbach, Württemberg as the only son of military doctor Johann Caspar Schiller and Elizabeth Dorothea Code Weiss. Schiller grew up in a very religious family and spent much of his youth studying the Bible, which would later influence his writing for the theatre. They also had five daughters. His father was away in the Seven Years' War when Friedrich was born. He was named after King Frederick the Great, but he was called Fritz by nearly everyone. Caspar Schiller was rarely home during the war, but he did manage to visit the family once in a while. His wife and children also visited him occasionally wherever he happened to be stationed. When the war ended in 1763, Schiller's father became a recruiting officer and was stationed in Schwabisch G. Mund. The family moved with him. Due to the high cost of living, especially the rent, the family moved to nearby Lorch. Although the family was happy in Lorch, Schiller's father found his work unsatisfying. He sometimes took his son with him. In Lorch, Schiller received his primary education. The quality of the lessons was fairly bad, and Friedrich regularly cut class with his older sister. Because his parents wanted Schiller to become a pastor, they had the pastor of the village instruct the boy in Latin and Greek. Pastor Moser was a good teacher, and later Schiller named the cleric in his first play Die Raube after him. As a boy, Schiller was excited by the idea of becoming a cleric and often put on black robes and pretended to preach. In 1766, the family left Lorch for the Duke of Wattenberg's principal residence, Ludwigsburg. Schiller's father had not been paid for three years, and the family had been living on their savings but could no longer afford to do so. So Caspar Schiller took an assignment to the garrison in Ludwigsburg. There the Schiller boy came to the attention of Karl Eugen, Duke of Wattenberg. He entered the Karlsjul Stuttgart in 1773, where he eventually studied medicine. During most of his short life, he suffered from illnesses that he tried to cure himself. While at the Karlsjul, Schiller read Rousseau and Goethe and discussed classical ideals with his classmates. At school, he wrote his first play, The Robbers, which dramatizes the conflict between two aristocratic brothers. The elder, Karl Moore, leads a group of rebellious students into the Bohemian forest where they become Robin Hood-like bandits, while Franz Moore, the younger brother, schemes to inherit his father's considerable estate. The play's critique of social corruption and its affirmation of proto-revolutionary republican ideals astounded its original audience. Schiller became an overnight sensation. Later, Schiller would be made an honorary member of the French Republic because of this play. The play was inspired by Lysowitz's earlier play Julius of Tarrant, a favorite of the young Schiller. In 1780, he obtained a post as regimental doctor in Stuttgart, a job he disliked. In order to attend the first performance of The Robbers in Mannheim, Schiller left his regiment without permission. As a result, he was arrested, sentenced to 14 days of imprisonment, and forbidden by Karl Eugen from publishing any further works. He fled Stuttgart in 1782, going via Frankfurt, Mannheim, Leipzig, and Dresden to Weimar. Along this journey he had an affair with an army officer's wife Charlotte von Kalb. She was at the center of an intellectual circle, and she was known for her cleverness and instability. Schiller needed help to extricate himself from his family and friends. Schiller settled in Weimar in 1787. 
In 1789, he was appointed Professor of History and Philosophy in Jena, where he wrote only historical works, marriage and family. On the 22nd of February 1790, Schiller married Charlotte von Lengerfeld. Two sons and two daughters were born between 1793 and 1804. The last living descendant of Schiller was a grandchild of Emily, Baron Alexander von Gleichenruss Worm, who died at Baden-Baden, Germany, in 1947. Weimar and later career. Schiller returned with his family to Weimar from Jena in 1799. Goethe convinced him to return to playwriting. He and Goethe founded the Weimar Theatre, which became the leading theatre in Germany. Their collaboration helped lead to a renaissance of drama in Germany. For his achievements, Schiller was ennobled in 1802 by the Duke of Saxe Weimar, adding the nobiliary particle von to his name. He remained in Weimar, Saxe Weimar until his death at 45 from tuberculosis in 1805. Legacy and Honours the first significant biography of Schiller was by his sister-in-law, Caroline von Wolzogen in 1830. The coffin containing what was purportedly Schiller's skeleton was brought in 1827 into the Weimarer Fersengruft. The burial place of the house of Saxe Weimar Eisenach in the historical cemetery of Weimar and later also go of Thies resting place. On 3 May 2008, scientists announced that DNA tests have shown that the skull of this skeleton is not Schiller's, and his tomb is now vacant. The physical resemblance between this skull and the extant death mask as well as to portraits of Schiller, had led many experts to believe that the skull was Schiller's. The city of Stuttgart erected in 1839 a statute in his memory on a square renamed Schiller Plates. A Schiller monument was unveiled on Berlin's Gendarmenmarkt in 1871. In September 2008, Schiller was voted by the audience of the TV channel Art as the second most important playwright in Europe after William Shakespeare. Freemasonry Some Freemasons speculate that Schiller was a Freemason, but this has not been proven. In 1787, in his tenth letter about Don Carlos, Schiller wrote, I am neither Illuminati nor Mason, but if the fraternization has a moral purpose in common with one another, and if this purpose for human society is the most important, in a letter from 1829, two Freemasons from Rudolstadt complain about the dissolving of their lodge Gunther's Umsterhend and Lowen that was honored by the initiation of Schiller, according to Schiller's great-grandson Alexander von Gleichenrussworm. Schiller was brought to the lodge by Wilhelm Heinrich Karl von Gleichenrussworm. No membership document has been found. Writing Philosophical papers Schiller wrote many philosophical papers on ethics and aesthetics. He synthesized the thought of Immanuel Kant with the thought of the German idealist philosopher Karl Leonhard Reinhold. He elaborated Christoph Martin Wieland's concept of Diskone Seal, a human being whose emotions have been educated by reason, so that Flicht and Neung are no longer in conflict with one another, thus beauty, for Schiller, is not merely an aesthetic experience but a moral one as well. The good is the beautiful. His philosophical work was also particularly concerned with the question of human freedom, a preoccupation which also guided his historical researches, such as the Thirty Years' War and the Dutch Revolt, and then found its way as well into his dramas. Schiller wrote two important essays on the question of the sublime, entitled Von der Herbenen and Uber das Herbein. These essays address one aspect of human freedom, the ability to defy one's animal instincts, such as the drive for self-preservation, when, for example, someone willingly sacrifices themselves for conceptual ideals. Dramas Schiller is considered by most Germans to be Germany's most important classical playwright. Critics like F.J. Lamport and Eric Auerbach have noted his innovative use of dramatic structure in his creation of new forms such as the melodrama and the bourgeois tragedy. What follows is a brief, chronological description of the plays. The Robbers, 
The language of the robbers is highly emotional, and the depiction of physical violence in the play marks it as a quintessential work of Germany's romantic Sturm und Drang movement. The Robbers is considered by critics like Peter Brooks to be the first European melodrama. The play pits two brothers against each other in alternating scenes, as one quests for money and power, while the other attempts to create revolutionary anarchy in the Bohemian Forest. The play strongly criticizes the hypocrisies of class and religion, and the economic inequities of German society. It also conducts a complicated inquiry into the nature of evil. Schiller was inspired by the play Julius of Tarrant by Johann Anton Lysowitz. Fiesco, Intrigue and Love The aristocratic Ferdinand von Walter wishes to marry Louise Miller, the bourgeois daughter of the city's music instructor. Court politics involving the Duke's beautiful but conniving mistress Lady Milford and Ferdinand's ruthless father create a disastrous situation, reminiscent of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Schiller develops his criticisms of absolutism and bourgeois hypocrisy in this bourgeois tragedy. Act 2, Scene 2 is an anti-British parody that depicts a firing squad massacre. Young Germans who refused to join the Hessians and British to quash the American Revolutionary War are fired upon. Don Carlos This play marks Schiller's entree into historical drama very loosely based on the events surrounding the real Don Carlos of Spain. Schiller's Don Carlos is another Republican figure. He attempts to free Flanders from the despotic grip of his father, King Philip. The Marquis Poser's famous speech to the king proclaims Schiller's belief in personal freedom and democracy. The Wallenstein Trilogy Consisting of Wallenstein's Camp, the Piccolomini, and Wallenstein's Death. These plays follow the fortunes of the treacherous commander Albrecht von Wallenstein during the Thirty Years' War. Mary Stuart This history of the Scottish Queen, who was Elizabeth I's rival portrays Mary Stuart as a tragic heroine, misunderstood and used by ruthless politicians, including and especially Elizabeth, the Maid of Orleans, about Joan of Arc, the Bride of Messina, William Tell, Demetrius, Aesthetic Letters A pivotal work by Schiller was on the aesthetic education of man in a series of letters, first published 1794, which was inspired by the great disenchantment Schiller felt about the French Revolution, its degeneration into violence and the failure of successive governments to put its ideals into practice. Schiller wrote that, a great moment has found a little people. He wrote the letters as a philosophical inquiry into what had gone wrong, and how to prevent such tragedies in the future. In the letters he asserts that it is possible to elevate the moral character of a people, by first touching their souls with beauty, an idea that is also found in his poem Die Kunstler. Only through beauty's morning gate, dost thou penetrate the land of knowledge. On the philosophical side, letters put forth the notion of der sinnlich tribe, sinistrieb and formtrieb. In a comment to Immanuel Kant's philosophy, Schiller transcends the dualism between Formtrieb and Sinistrieb with the notion of Spieltrieb, derived from, as are a number of other terms, Kant's critique of the faculty of judgment, the conflict between man's material, sensuous nature and his capacity for reason. Schiller resolves with the happy union of Formtrieb and Sinistrieb, the play drive, which for him is synonymous with artistic beauty, or living form. On the basis of Spieltrieb, Schiller sketches in letters a future ideal state, where everyone will be content, and everything will be beautiful, thanks to the free play of Spieltrieb. Schiller's focus on the dialectical interplay between Formtrieb and Sinistrieb has inspired a wide range of succeeding aesthetic philosophical theory, including notably Jacques Rancière's conception of the aesthetic regime of art, as well as social philosophy and Herbert Marcuse. In the second part of his important work Eros and Civilization, Marcuse finds Schiller's notion of Spieltrieb useful in thinking a social situation without the condition of modern social alienation. He writes, Schiller's letters, 
aim at remaking of civilization by virtue of the liberating force of the aesthetic function. It is envisaged as containing the possibility of a new reality principle, works. Plays di Rauber, 1781. Fiesco, 1783. Kabbalah und Liebe, 1784. Don Carlos, Infant von Spanien, 1787. Wallenstein, 1800. Maria Stuart, 1800. Die Jungfrau von Orleans, 1801. Turandot, Prinzessin von China, 1801. Die Braut von Messina, 1803. Wilhelm Tell, 1804, Demetrius, Histories Geschichte des Abfalls der Vereinigten Niederlande von der Spanischen Regierung or the Revolt of the Netherlands, Geschichte des Dreisigerigen Kriegs or a History of the Thirty Years' War, Uber Volkerwanderung, Kruzuga and Mittelalter or on the Barbarian Invasions, Crusaders and Middle Ages. Translations Euripides, Iphigenia in Olis, William Shakespeare, Macbeth, Jean, Racine, Fedri, Carlo Gotzi, Turandot, 1801, Prose der Geistes her or the Ghost Seer, Uber die as the Tisterersi hung there's mention in Ina Raya von Briefen, 1794, Der Verbrecher aus Valora Era, 1786. Poems and Die Freude became the basis for the fourth movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Der Taucher, Die Kranisch des Ibicus, Der Ring des Polycrates, Die Bergschaft, Das Lied von der Glock, Das Fischlerierte Bild Zeus, Der Handschuh, Nanny, Quotations, Respect the Dreams of Thy Youth, Mit der Dummheit Kampf und Gottes selbst Vergebens, which means, against stupidity the gods themselves contend in vain. Deeper meaning resides in the fairy tales told to me in my childhood than in any truth that is taught in life. Eine Grenz hat die Tyrannen Macht, which means, a tyrant's power has a limit. The voice of the majority is no proof of justice. It is not flesh and blood but the heart which makes us fathers and sons. Live with your century but do not be its creature. Musical settings. Ludwig van Beethoven said that a great poem is more difficult to set to music than a merely good one because the composer must rise higher than the poet who can do that in the case of Schiller. In this respect Goethe is much easier, wrote Beethoven. There are relatively few famous musical settings of Schiller's poems. Two notable exceptions are Beethoven's setting of Und die Freude in the final movement of his Ninth Symphony, and Johannes Brahms' choral setting of Nanny. In addition, several poems were set by Franz Schubert his leader, such as Die Bergschaft, mostly for voice and piano. In 2005 Graham Waterhouse set Der Handschuh for cello and speaking voice. The Italian composer Giuseppe Verdi admired Schiller greatly and adapted several of his stage plays for his operas. Imas Nadieri is based on The Robbers, Giovanna d'Arco on The Maid of Orleans, Louisa Miller on Intrigue and Love, La Forza del Destino is based partly on Wallenstein, and Don Carlos on the play of the same title. Donny's 80s Maria Stewart is based on Mary Stewart, and Rossini's Guillaume Tell is an adaptation of William Tell. Nicola Vacai's Giovanna d'Arco is based on the Maid of Orleans and his last Bosa di Messina on the Bride of Messina. Tchaikovsky's 1881 opera The Maid of Orleans is partly based on Schiller's work. The 20th century composer Gisela Kleber adapted The Robbers for his first opera of the same name, which premiered in 1957. Schiller's Burial, a poem written about the poet's burial. Two dim and paltry torches that the raging storm and rain at any moment threatened to put out. A waving pall, a vulgar coffin made of pine with not a wreath, not e'en the poorest, and no train, as if a crime were swiftly carried to the grave. The bearers hastened onward, one unknown alone, round whom a mantle waved of wide and noble fold, follow this coffin, t'was the spirit of mankind, Conrad Ferdinand Meyer Bibliography.
Lahnstein, Peter, 1981, Schiller's Leben, Frankfurt am Main, Fischer, ISBN 3-596-25621-6, Engel, Manfred, Schiller und W.I.R., Vernos Grosser and A.H.E., Oxford German Studies 37-1. 37 to 49. Schiller's complete works are published in the following excellent editions. Historical Critical Edition by K. Godik. Sakula Osgarbi Edition by von der Helen. Historical Critical Edition by Gunther and Witkowski. Other valuable editions are the Hempel Edition, the Boxberger Edition, in Kirchner's National Literature, the edition by Kutcher and Zisler, the Hoare in Osgarbi. The edition of the Temple Classica, Helios Classica, documents and other memorials of Schiller are in the Goethe und Schiller Archive in Weimar.